Now let's take our Bibles and we are going to turn to the book of Acts chapter 1. The book of Acts in chapter 1. Now we'll let the boys go to junior church as we turn to this book. Notice this former account or treatise, as the King James says, actually it's not, uh, the the treatise is, uh, account is probably a little bit more accurate because the book of John is a treatise, which is basically he gives you a prologue, then he gives you all the the things that he says he's going to do, and then he gives you an epilogue or a, a summation and then an epilogue, and that's more of a treatise, whereas Luke was more of a, a historian. He is a um, he is he is a physician. Of course, we know he's a beloved physician, and he was Paul's personal uh, physician. Uh, and we know that uh, he went to Rome with Paul on that ship. And you'll see in the book of Acts, he'll say uh, certain things about certain people. That, but then he will change the pronouns from they to we. And so we'll see that, uh, that uh, Luke, who was not an apostle, but he was a great historian. And in fact, uh, he is a, the Bible is infallible, which means the Bible tells us and Paul tells us that uh, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That means it's God breathed. That means and God is perfect. And so the word of God has to be perfect. Now, the Bible isn't a science book. But when it speaks on science, it has to be exactly right, doesn't it? If it speaks on history, it has to be exactly right. And so whatever it speaks on, we see that uh, it must be exactly right because it's perfect. Uh, notice, uh, Luke was Paul's personal physician, uh, and he was a historian. Therefore, when he mentions anything about health, he, is totally, he must be totally accurate. Uh, Luke all the way through the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, we see uh, he talks about medical terms. And one of the reasons it's hard to translate Luke in Greek is because he uses a lot of classical Greek because he's writing to a guy named Theophilus. Uh, uh, Classical Greek was the stuff that Homer and Iliad and Odyssey and all that stuff is. That's the more, that was the literary Greek. And then there was what was called the trade language Greek, which was Koine Greek. And that's the Greek that the, the traders would use uh, from Spain to India. And uh, the Greek Empire, uh, it was, it, uh, was uh, if, you, you, if you knew a little bit of that Greek, then you could make all kinds of good traits. And so, and by, guess what? The Bible was written in trade language Greek, Koine Greek. And so, but, uh, but there are times we see that it is written uh, in co- uh, that is the classical Greek, and Luke is a lot of it. And one of the reasons, because he's a physician, and uh, he will talk about, when he talks about a needle, he doesn't use the term needle like you and I do, and like the other Gospels would use. Uh, when he's talking about a surgical needle, he uses the Greek terminology for the needle, much like we would do with a knife, and a surgeon would say what? Scapel. And so that's uh, the, the, the Paul... Uh, he talks about ankles. He talks about sores. He talks about uh, about different malady. Is it any wonder that the Lord used him to talk about the virgin birth? If anybody would be uh, a uh, an example or a, a teacher of, or, or the the best person to write about the virgin birth would be uh, Doctor Luke. And so we see that uh, whatever he, but whatever he wrote on had to be exactly right. Now, there was a guy named, uh, named uh, William Ramsey. And William Ramsey uh, was an English skeptic, a nobleman. He had a lot of money. But he said, I'm going to prove the Bible wrong. And I'm going to lo- use uh, Luke and the, the travels of Paul to prove that Luke didn't know what he's talking about. Now, this is back uh, about the time when Joseph Smith was writing the Book of Mormon and all that stuff and all those tribes. And everything. There's none of, none of this, or very little of that has been confirmed at all. They can't find those, oh, I forget all the terms that they use, uh, the tribes that Joseph Smith talks about in the tablets that came down. They're not there. I mean, they've looked up and down these places. They can't find much of anything that uh, would even allude to some of the things that Joseph Smith wrote about. And so basically, Sir uh, 
And basically, later on, because of his great work in archaeology, he was knighted. He was, later on became uh, Sir William Ram Ramsey. But uh, he went over there, and he just was astounded. He kept trying to prove that Luke was wrong, and he kept proving through the archaeology that Luke was right. He said Derby never existed, and because after it had two or three different names, but Derby was never a name. But then he went over there, started digging around, and they found a plate in uh, or a, a city sign, and it had Derby on it. And then the more he excavated around there, he said, that, yes, this city's been named all kinds of things, both before and after, but at the exact time that Paul was there and that Luke wrote about it, it was named Derby. And so he just kept finding all these things, and it wasn't long before he said, if you can't beat them, join them, you know? And so he was one of the few people, and but this is the problem, folks, is people are, going get, you are not going to get saved by miracles or by archaeology. They're going to get saved by the call of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit in their lives. But fortunately, God was working on his life, and uh, he's one of the few people that got saved. You, could, you say, well, oh my, if they just find the Noah's Ark. Well, folks, if they find the Noah's Ark, and it says Noah's Ark over it, and it has all the names of the animals, two by two, seven by two, whatever, uh, and people go, and, they, and it's conclusive evidence that Jesus Christ, or excuse me, that Noah was on the ark, that still wouldn't change things. Remember what the Lord told the rich, uh, the rich man in hell? He said, uh, they've got other people, and uh, you won't, but uh, just like you knew all about me and rejected me, they are going to, no matter what I do, it's their choice. And so here we see that Luke is, uh, is a divine historian, but the thing about it, the Bible does throw it open. When God says that all Scripture is inspired, it is saying, take a look at it, test me. And so that's the great thing about the Bible is, is that it says it's inspired, so let me show you. I love to study this because uh, there were back uh, in the 1800s, Hittites didn't exist. You know, and all this, because you saw Moses and uh, what he was writing about with Abraham and the Hittites and buying the field from uh, Machpelah or the cave of Machpelah um, from the Hittites. Uh, so they didn't exist. But then the more they uh, uh, scrounged around and looked around uh, the Middle East, not, not only was it, were the Hittites existing, but they existed and they had their, tra they were tradespeople. And later on, they were really concentrated. They became uh, concentrated with the Phoenicians. But uh, they were tradespeople all the way from Egypt to uh, into Greece and into Europe. And there were all kinds of, the Hittites were up and down that uh, western seaboard uh, of, the Med, or the, uh, of the Mediterranean Sea, actually, uh, the eastern side of the Mediterranean, but western side of the Middle East. And, uh, and there were the Hittites. And not only that, but there was a guy named Hammurabi. And Hammurabi had written one of the first and the most extant uh, codes of law that uh, the world had seen other than outside the Bible. And it was called the Hittite Code of Hammurabi and all these different things that they, they found out. And so simply because they said the Bible has errors because the Hittites don't, didn't exist, folks, just hang around and God will show. Oh, my, this is the, they try to prove that the, that the things don't, that the, the Bible is an error. Whenever someone does that to you, just sit back and and. Let God deal with Now, I'm not saying just blind faith. Well, I've got to believe it because the Bible says, no, God will prove it. Taste and suffer. Prove ye me, God says. See if I am not right. So the Bible sets up and tells us, and it, it gives us, and it, it, it uh, wants us to examine to see if these things are true. Remember, uh, that's a good Berean, is to search the Scriptures to see if these things are true. And then verify the Scriptures by what you see. And so that's, that's great uh, uh, theology and it's great practice. And here, so we see that Luke, he says, this former account that I made with you, O Theophilus, and we're going to go back if you, in a moment and look at Luke, um, of all that the Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, that's the ascension, after he, uh, he through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he had presented himself alive after he had, uh, after his sufferings um, with many infallible 
That's perfect. That's uh, indisputable proofs. Being seen by them during the 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with the water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, Father, we pray that you would bless the reading of your word and the understanding of our hearts this morning as we would look and be challenged by what you have called us to be and as witnesses for Jesus Christ. Oh, we pray your blessings upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we see this former account or this former treatise. If you turn back to the book of Luke, and keep your finger there in the book of Acts, but if you want to turn back and see this former account, we see that he is writing uh, in Luke, Luke chapter 1. He says, and by the way, the book of Luke is the longest book in the New Testament. And the book of Acts is the second longest book in the New Testament. So Luke was a prolific writer. He was a very thorough writer. Uh, he was a scholar. He was everything you want to be as far as uh, knowing what he's talking about and the things that God had said about, of course, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But notice in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Inasmuch as many have taken into hand to set in order the narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. Okay, there's a lot of people talking about it, but and there's been a lot of people set down a narrative or an account or uh, of this. He says, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. He says, I now have talked to uh, eyewitnesses. Uh, there's a uh, there are several uh, biographers that uh, I'm reading, and uh, I get a little frustrated with these biographers, especially the ones that are very thorough. There's a guy named Robert Caro, and he's written four volumes, and he's gotten a Pulitzer Prize on one or two of them at least, on Lyndon Baines Johnson. Now, Johnson was the man that really had a lot of influence on my life when I was 17, 18 years old by the decisions he made. And I've read all those, uh, those uh, biographies or those, those four sections or four books of, of uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson. But now the guy's up in his 80s, and uh, now we're all afraid he's going to die before he ever gets to the end. You know, that's just something about that. He's just very thorough. But uh, so there's a lot of people who write a lot of different books. And so Luke has written this book. And he is saying, now, I'm setting a, this is something I have seen. I have talked. And one of the things that makes Cairo so interesting is that he has extensive notes on the people he's talked to. And that's what Luke is, he said, now I've talked to a lot of these people. These guys were eyewitnesses. And I have gotten my biography and what I am talking about. I know these fellows. I know, uh, I talked to them before they died. And that's the one thing that uh, gets uh, Cairo in problems is because all the people now that uh, he's wanting to talk to are dying off. And so he's got to get to them fast. And, but then he gets so many notes that he never has time to write the book. You know, that get, kind of gets you uh, a little frustrated. But here we see that, uh, that he says, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. So I have seen it. They have delivered them to me. I know. I've heard them preach. I've heard them teach. Uh, it seemed good to me also, having perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write. Why did he have perfect understanding? Because God inspired him. To write the things to you in an orderly account. So I'm setting this all down to word. Most excellent Theophilus. Now, who was Theophilus? His name means lover of God. But, uh, but, he, but this is the term that he uses in the book of Luke. Most excellent probably means that he was a Roman official somewhere in the Roman Empire. And he was, uh, now over in the book of Acts, he just said, oh, Theophilus. So uh, G. Campbell Morgan and others like to think that uh, Theophilus probably was saved as a Roman official, but like Matthew had to give up his position because of his 
stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he might have lost it all because in the book of Luke, he's most excellent the Theophilus. In other words, the way you address a high official. But in the book of Acts, he is just a friend, O Theophilus. So that's kind of an interesting side light there. But he says, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know with certainty or know the certainty of the things which you were instructed. The one thing that the Luke, uh, this, Luke is telling, I want you to know as a fact the things that Jesus did, what he did and what he taught. And now we see in the book of Acts, if you flip over there again, we see that this is the same type of thing he's saying, O Theophilus, uh, that I'm writing this uh, former account or treat this former uh, narrative. He says, now, uh, of all things that, Drew, that uh, Jesus did, uh, knows the, where the Jesus both uh, to do and to teach. To do and to teach. That's what the Lord did. He did and he taught. He showed and he taught. And so he said, you know, follow me. And that's what he did for three solid years. He did and he taught. And now as a result of that, we see that, uh, that, uh, that, it, that uh, he says to them, there's three basic things. And then Luke's introduction in chapters 1 through 10, uh, verses 1 through 10 of chapter 1 of the book of, of uh, Acts, we read the first five verses. But the purpose uh, of, God, of, of Jesus' teaching, and that is he is teaching the, now he's going to, is teaching these, these men, he is now verifying his, now can you imagine being with the Lord for 40 days? Wouldn't that be great? I mean, how many times did they see his hands? How many times did, as we saw Moses over and over and just kept stressing major points as we looked in Sunday school for the last several weeks, oh, children, do this, do this. These are the things that will bless you. These things will curse you. All the different things that he taught them. He taught them. He says, you've got a big job to do. You're going to reach the world. Now, can you imagine 12 guys being taught that you're going to reach the world? Now, we got a little more than that this morning. Can you imagine God telling us that? But that basically, isn't that what he told us to do anyway? So we got to ask. So we see, first of all, to, to what is God doing in this church and what is he teaching, teaching us to do? But then secondly, in chapter, verses 6 through 8, we'll see that the power, the, uh, you shall be witnesses. After that, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you shall be witnesses, both in Jerusalem, that's our Belvedere, in Judea, that's our Boone County, um, in Samaria, that's every place else in, in the country. And then to the uttermost parts of the world, that's, where, that's our missionaries. So we see that the, this is a pattern that God now has set up for us to do. And he says, uh, and you show, if you, he says to them that you, that you will receive the Holy Spirit power. And I want you to wait on it. Now, how long did they have to wait? They had to wait. Now, the Lord would, came, what, if the church was begun on the day of Pentecost, which 50, day, 50 days after Passover Sunday, and the Lord was with them from Passover Sunday, which was the first day of the week, until 40 days, that means they had to wait 10 days, right? Do the math. So after the Lord taught them for 40 days, Luke is the only one that tells us that he taught them for 40 days. But here we see that he says, now wait on me after I leave. And so we see that there will be, the, that uh, there's a power that you're going to get on that day if you'll wait on it. And then you're also going to get a promise. And that's in verse 9 through 11, 9 and 10. He says, this same Jesus. And this is very important, the way that he sets up, just like with the Gospel of John, those first few verses are extremely important because it sets forth the, the pattern of the rest of the book. And so we see then the purpose of the teaching, and that's what we're going to look at this morning, it was that the Lord gave commandments through the Holy Spirit. Now, notice the Holy Spirit was given to them in increments. Now, you say, well, how can the Holy Spirit given, be given in increments? Because God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that means that there are times when God is God deals with, with us in different ways. 
Christianity is not a religion. It is not a cult. It is a relationship with a living person. Remember what he said, what we see here? That he, he showed himself, he was alive with them. He lived with them for 40 days. He's a living God. And as a result of that, we have relationship. Now, if the Holy Spirit is also a person, don't we have a relationship with Him? Be not drunk with wine, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Now, that means that as a relationship, sometimes we're a little bit closer to the Lord than other times, or the relationship is a little bit different at times than others. I wish I could say that uh, my wife and I have just been a lover's lane ever since uh, we've been married. Now, I've loved her, and I've never thought about ever, you know, as someone, as a, as a, I had a good friend said, she's a keeper. And I said, yes, she's a keeper. So, you know, she's, a, she's somebody that, I mean, and I love it whenever she tells people, it just gets better and better. I'm going, oh, praise the Lord. You know, I just love that. You know, just uh, I love the fact that, but you know, there's been some rough times there. I mean, when you're raising four kids, and you're going to work at four o'clock in the morning and not getting back home to eight at night. And then you got to listen to kids scream before you go back to bed. You know, uh, I, I wish I, I was just so spirit filled, folks, that I just said, you dear wife, you've done such a wonderful job. And those children are just so good. No, I was grouchy as the day is long. <laughs> no. And I like well, then she got my goat the other uh, Wednesday night. I, the standard fair I was t- talking to, uh, mostly ladies were here that night. And I said, uh, you know, it really is hard to have a perfect marriage whenever only one of us is perfect. And then later on, we were talking and something came up and she, she said, well, you told me I was perfect. And I go, OK, so she took it that she was the one perfect, you know, so whatever. But, you know, it, it comes and goes, doesn't it? Well, there's a power and there's the relationship with the Lord. I wish I could say that I was always just walking right with the Lord. Uh, when we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. When we do His good will, He abides with us still. Never fear, only trust and obey. Isn't that a great verse? But I wish I could say I never stumbled. I wish I could say I'd, I didn't put other things in front of Him. I wish I could say I'd never sinned, but I can't. I could have to, I have to say uh, with the writer Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. You know, my, aren't you glad you have a God who loves you more than you love him? And so here we see that, yes, there, he gave, he started introducing, remember in chapter 14 through 16 of the book of Luke, or the book, book of John, he introduced the Holy Spirit to them. And he said, this is going to be what's happening. This is what I'm going to send in my stead. And now we see in verse, uh, in chapter 20, that, uh, and they, he told them, he breathed on them. There again, there's that inspiration. And he started, the Holy Spirit started coming upon these, but it never came to fruition until the day of Pentecost, as far as the full fledged, uh, the ordination of the Holy Spirit upon the church, because that was what's going to change. That was the, that was a great pivotal, pivotal day in, in world history was when God changed institutions from the Jew to the Gentile church. And so we'll see that as we go along. And, 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 uh, act, and Luke is going to depict that. Luke was a Greek. And so it's interesting, God used a, uh, a Grecian to uh, tell us about the Word of God. So here we see that, uh, that, uh, the, uh, that uh, the God breathed on us. And notice he presented it, verse, uh, he presented himself alive. I like what, Pete, what, uh, what uh, Luke says there. He presented himself alive for 40 days. Hey, and I like what a lawyer said about this. He said, the Bible's, and there, Jesus has to be uh, God. Because whenever you get 12 guys together and you really put, start putting pressure on them about certain facts and you threaten them with their lies if they, if they don't tell the truth, you get all kinds of things and people start talking whenever. But he said, the one thing that convinces me that Jesus is God, that these guys stuck together and their message was the same as the beginning and all of them are willing to die for him. He said, that convinces me as a lawyer that Jesus Christ is God. 
And so here we see that uh, they saw it. And this is what uh, he says in those 40 days. Luke is the only one who mentions uh, the length of time between the resurrection and the ascension. And these many infallible true proofs. Notice now John even opens up. And John really tells, remember, he's the one who laid on Jesus' breast. But notice he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, we've gazed upon him. Forty days we've seen him. And our hands have handled, we put our hands in his side. We have touched him. We know who he is. He says, but our hands have handled concerning the word of life. That's the, he opens up First John, the epistle of John, with that very fact. I am an eyewitness. I saw him. I heard him. I touched him. I know him. And I know that he wants to bless you. And what did he say? These things are right that you may know what I know. Why? Because that's what the Lord commissioned him to do here in Acts chapter 1, that he was to be a witness. And that's why our witness in John chapter 1, I wish we don't, we don't have time to go to examine that chapter, but he says, truly, uh, we want to have fellowship with you. And the last uh, verses of the book of Revelation, the last books of the, of the Bible, the last verses, it says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the bride, that's the church, say, come, don't we want to have fellowship with the world? We want them to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit and the bride say, come. We want, we desire for people to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, these things I've written unto you. He says that, that you may have fellowship with us. We want you to have fellowship with us. When people come, I like to tell people, I, I don't want to put the world's friendliest church on our motto or anything. Uh, Christianity just should be friendly, shouldn't it? Christianity should be saying, y'all come. Christianity should be accepted in the beloved. I hope that whenever, I like it whenever people say, you know, come to church, just feel like you just part of just like you knew those people forever. Well, that's what, that's the way we should be, shouldn't it? And that doesn't mean that we don't have our problems. Doesn't mean that at times we're sick or we get, or we don't feel right or we've had some bad things happen the week before or whatever. But at the same time, that's the reason we come because that's where we find our comfort. That's where our buddies are. And then that's where we want to, to see others blessed like we are. So truly, we want to have fellowship with you. But truly, our fellowship is with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, we have a horizontal relationship as Christians. But then we have a vertical relationship. But those two should intertwine. And so when we have fellowship tonight, and by the way, we have kimchi or what could kimchi or whatever it is. Uh, we got a foreign dish tonight, folks. That's going to be great. But, uh, but you know, uh, how many times did the Lord eat with his disciples? Over and over again, we see that he ate with his disciples. And, Luke, and again, Luke tells us that in chapter 24, that he ate with them repeatedly. And so uh, we see that, yes, he wants to have fellowship with us, but truly we want to have other people to have fellowship with, with him also, don't we? And so are you a missionary or a mission field? Are you a person that when people get around you, they are reminded of who Jesus Christ is? Or are you the mission field where people have to remind you of who Jesus is? And so here we see that that's the whole job that God has set us up to be is witnesses. And that's going to be the theme of the book of Acts is a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the very purpose of his teaching was the, to, the, to these disciples was, hey, folks, you're going to change the world. Now you're going to take a graduate qu- uh, class on theology in the next 40 days. And I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know. I'm not going to teach you everything I know because I'm omnipotent and omniscient. But I'm going to teach you enough that you can change the world. Now, I like what uh, a philosopher, uh, author by the name of G.K. or C.K. Chesterton said, Christianity is not tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and not tried. And that's so true. It's not that people have tried it and found that Christianity could not meet the needs it's for me to be found difficult. Why? Because whenever I repent and whenever I get saved, when I got saved, I said, Lord, not my will, but mine. When I said, not my pride, but yours. When I said, not my life, but yours. 
Folks, that's a total change in life. And the main reasons that people will not get saved is because they will not admit that they're a sinner in need of salvation. They've got too many other things to do. They've got too much, uh, too many things to possess. Uh, they've got the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life. Those three things are going to keep people back from knowing the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And so we see that, uh, yeah, there is a price to pay. Take up my, your cross and follow me. A person carrying a cross was a walking dead man. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. I mean, whenever you get saved, folks, it wasn't that you added something to your life. It, it was that the Lord Jesus came into your life and took over. And that's what salvation is all about. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord, you're saying, you're my God. You are the one I'm willing to submit to and to follow all the days of my life. And so we see that this is the message, that the, make the message clear and plain. Jesus, or Christ receiveth what? Good men. No, Christ receiveth sinful men. And that's the one thing today, especially we see in a world... In fact, it's in, in, in the, United, uh, the, uh, the United Kingdom, England, they are now trying to pass laws that you can't say anything about the transgenderism or about uh, the immorality and the perversions that are going on over there. They don't want to hear it. They want to make laws that it is hate speech to even say anything about that. Well, my friend, the Bible says anything outside of marriage is wrong. Now, you take your gander or whatever that means. Oh, but uh, the Bible also says male and female created these them. Uh, the Bible tells me that uh, I sure, you ladies sure are pretty. I love your dresses and the way that you dress differently. And I, well, I don't know. I better be careful dressing whatever you're wearing today. I don't, you know, guys don't notice that. You women notice that more than we do. But you know, your femininity, let's put it that way. But you know, those are, those are all great things. But I sure am glad God made you that way because I, would, I just don't like being around a bunch of guys all the time because they're ugly, they're not as pretty as you are. You know, isn't it good to have women around? Uh, you, know, you know, like we used to say in the Navy, you'd be out, six, you'd be out on the, a ship for six months and not see or even hear a feminine voice. The first time you hear a feminine voice is see a, a female form. I mean, it drives you batty, you know. But that's the way God made us. Isn't that great? And for people to want to straightjacket us and say that I, I like what someone said, that uh, phrase, I think, therefore I am. And that's what, what they're saying today. Uh, dualism, philo philosophical dualism that is being taught in our Ivy League schools that you can't really know, you know, the way that God created us or whatever else. Uh, I mean, this is coming from intelligent people. I like what someone said. I think, therefore I am Aristotle. And I like what someone said, I think, therefore I am, I think. <laughs> so, you know, they're not sure what they are. So, again, uh, we see that, uh, no, God is the one that's the, <clears throat> is he, it is he who created us and not ourselves. And it is he who saves us and not ourselves. Everything depends on the Lord and what he's done for us. Whether he's created us or whether he has recreated us, through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we see several things here. And notice uh, also that, um, pertain, that he taught them pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, what did God tell us to do? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, a kingdom presupposes a what? A king, a sovereign. So king of my life, I crown thee thou, thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to... Gethsemane. So here again, we see that uh, when I gave my life to the Lord Jesus, and when a person gets saved, they're saying, Lord, I surrender my will to yours. That's repentance, isn't it? Repentance is a change of direction. It's a change of mind. And so the whole doctrine that is coming forth now is these are the things that he taught them, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish, the Lord said. And so this is the things that he's teaching them. It wasn't going to be popular, but it was going to be powerful. 
And so he said, he commanded them to wait on the promise. And there's a couple of promises. The one promise is, I'm not going to leave you alone. And I've already told you that back in chapters 14 through 16 of John, that uh, I will send the comforter. I will send the convictor. I will send the empower. I will send the friend. I will send the Holy Spirit. And he will testify all these things through you. But then also he says in verse 10, uh, he says, guess what? I have a real prize for you. I'm coming again. You're going to see me again. Now, the book of Thessalonians, Paul had to kind of help people because the Lord said he was coming again, but people were dying. So Paul had to tell us that, yes, people are going to die, but they're going to rise first, and then we which are alive together shall meet the Lord in the air. Uh, simply because he didn't come in the last 2,000 years doesn't mean that his promise still isn't fulfilled today. Jesus is coming again. I like to tell people, uh, I have a good friend. He's got cancer now over in Michigan. Actually, he was just one of the dear, dear servant of God, serving the Lord today in church. But uh, as far as we know, uh, his cancer is in remission. But at any time, it takes back over and he's gone. And he knows that. But... Uh, but uh, I was saying, you know, Billy, uh, I sure hope that we're part of the, part not the millennial generation, but of the rapture generation. I hope the Lord comes before either one of us dies. Wouldn't it be great to be in heaven and know that we're the only people in heaven that never died? I mean, everybody else has died there except, you know, Elijah and Enoch. But uh, everybody else has died. But wouldn't it be good to know that... Uh, that we were the only ones who never had a bodily death. But that'd be a great generation, wouldn't it? But even if it doesn't, even if I die before you do, and the Lord comes while you're still on earth, I'll still go to meet him first because he says, I'm going to be risen first. Isn't that great? So he gives a consolation for those who die first. And so again, the promise that we have, folks, this whole world's not, oh, I'm just passing through. And if uh, I die absent from the body, present with the Lord in the first place. But if he, if he did, but as long as I'm here on earth, he's got a job for me to do. And that's to tell others, be ready. Therefore, be also ready for in such an hour as uh, you think not the Son of Man comes. So that's our message. You know the Lord is your Savior. So here we see the blessings that God has. Now, in saying that, we see also that the promise, the, the two promises, the, first of all, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power and also the promise of His coming. So it all begins with the Lord. It doesn't matter, you know, what I think. Well, I think that, you know, there's a lot of gods out there, and there are seminaries that are teaching this today. And, you know, God is a, a good God, and he's a, he's a father of everybody, and everybody's going, there can't be a hell because God is a loving God. That's what, what I think. Well, it doesn't matter what you think. It's what the Bible says. And we know that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And the Word of God talks six times more about hell than it does about heaven. And so again, we see it doesn't matter what you think. But without faith, faith in whom? Faith in a person. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Who's Him? Jesus. But they that come unto God must believe that He is. He is that He is, which is third person of I am that I am. So is Jesus Christ God? You must believe that he is. It's not that he is a God. It's not like one person who said, well, I accepted Jesus as my Savior, but now I'm safe because now I've got Buddha and Confucius. No, there's none other than name given among men, given under heaven, whereby men must be saved, but the name of the Lord Jesus. There's no equal. And again, Luke is going to record that message. And so we see that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It really doesn't matter what you think. It's who God is. He doesn't conform to you. You conform to Him. And so just as I am, without one plea, that's unconditional surrender to a living, true God. It doesn't really matter, um, you know, how I feel. 
And here's a real problem we're into today. We're in a feelings type of a type of a culture. I feel like this is all right. Or I feel that I should do this. Well, folks, you can feel all you want to. Um, I can feel like I'm a rich man, and I am in a lot of ways. But I can't go out and buy a Lamborghini right now. Whatever that is, don't even know it. I have never even seen one. You know, but there again, don't care. <laughs> but uh, but you know, uh, I can feel all kinds of. I like what one lady I was witnessing to one time. She said, "I know what you're saying, and I know I've read that in the Bible, but I know how I feel." I'm going, lady. I mean, I I wish I hope that she got saved since then, but uh, that those feelings will send you to hell. And of course, there's guys who do that. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not misogynist. I was just a lady that I thought about, but the men do that too. You know, I feel like, like I should do this. Well, the Lord says, I am the way, the truth. Truth is reality. Truth supersedes emotions or feelings. Truth is, you know, there's a cliff there. If you oh, take one too many steps, you're going to fall off. Well, I feel like I could float. Well, you feel like you want to all, oh, but sooner or later, it's reality is going to hit you. Or you're going to hit reality, one of the two. And so you can, but so again, the Lord Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And so you're not going to heaven, my friend, without the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't be, your church isn't going to save you. Your friends aren't going to save you. Your feelings aren't going to save you. The loving God that you have, that you've conjured up in your mind, that, that he all he is, he's just the God that uh, whenever I need him, I'll just call upon him and I have this feel-good motion. Or No, he's not the living God. The living God is the one who comes into your heart and saves you and comforts you, but he convicts you of sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. In other words, there's a possibility of perishing. Unless you, to as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become children of God. So whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it doesn't matter how you feel. And then there are those who say, you know, uh, but the world has changed so much in the last 2,000 years. I heard uh, one man on the radio talking about church, and uh, he was a theologian, and he was saying, uh, you know, the church has to come to grips with uh, a changing society, and we've got to start accepting some of the things that people are doing today. And, uh, you know, Jesus was a, was a God of love, and he would understand the problems and the heartaches that people go through, and what makes them do what they do today. Yes, the Lord understands why people do what they do today, because they're sinners. And God says, and this, He says, this same Jesus, whom you saw go into heaven. Folks, He's the same yesterday, today, forever. A lie is a lie, whether it was in Moses' time, Jesus' time, or in our time. Adultery is adultery, whether it's in uh, John's time, or our time. You, sin is sin. Murder is murder. All those, God, he says, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. His standard is still perfect. His standards have never changed. And he's the same God who dealt with Moses. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of our fathers. And he's, I hope he's your God. And if he is, aren't you glad that you could talk to the same God that Moses talked to? But he's got the same standards. He's got the same love. But he's also got the same judgment upon those who reject him. Moses said, I set before you today life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. And that's the message today. I set before you Jesus and Satan, which way you want to go? Choose life. He is the life. He is the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. And so, my friend, that's our message. The world's going to hell without the Lord Jesus. One of the things that <clears throat> I've kind of had an emotional week this week, um, I 
started to, uh, you always get a little down when you're going through therapy or treatments or whatever. And I had, it really hit me hard this past week. But then um, went out to the traveling wall, the Vietnam Memorial Wall. And I have a friend that uh, died 55 years ago, uh, this September. I remember it was, a, it was a day before my first uh, high school football game of that season as a senior in high school. He had, my brother had joined the service together, joined the Marine Corps together. And uh, I was with them whenever we took them to the Greyhound bus station to go to Paris Island for their training. And... Uh, I remember Cecil uh, growing up. Uh, all of us were kind of in and out of church. We didn't much have church families. And uh, I don't know, I'll just get up there and I'll take that. There's 58,000 men on that wall. And of course, back in that time, I was that was the time God was really dealing with her. From the time I graduated from high school all the way through to about a couple of years later, where he said, either you serve me now or you never will. Those were some horrible times in my life as far as ups and downs and things that were going on, uh, major decisions, then family problems and all the rest that were going on. It was just a horrible, a, a very emotional time. But to go up there and to take that pencil and to rub that name on there and the, all those thoughts start coming back on you. And for 55 years, those, that change that, you know, either you serve me now or you never will. And that the horror of it is that I've had chosen wrong. But then the horror of it is I look up there on the wall and I think, how many of those guys are I going to see in heaven? I hope all of them, but of course, you know what I'm talking saying. I said before you, death and life. Folks, it really doesn't matter how popular we are here on earth. It doesn't matter what we attain. It matters about where we're going. I said before you, death or life. That's the whole message. Make the message clear and plain. Christ receiveth sinful men, but they who reject him will not be with them for an eternity, but will suffer an eternal damnation in hell. That's our message, isn't it? That's a hard message, but it's a message that must be preached. And it doesn't matter how acceptable the world wants to be with their sin, we must still say, God will save you out of your sin, but he won't save you in your sin. It doesn't mean that we're not going to sin after we're saved, because we all do. But it does mean that I am willing to give my sin and let God take care of it in my life. Now, if you wait till, you, till you're perfect to be saved, you'll never be saved because we're still sinners. But the message is, God saves whom? Sinful people like us. Aren't you glad of that? We come to church every Sunday so that we can lose our conformity to the world in order to be, uh, to be transformed. We got Salvation in the Bible is not past action. If you're saved in the book of Acts, you're, you're being saved. God is saving us now, folks. Salvation began at my new birth just like these beautiful babies are here today. Uh, Esther didn't just say, you know, good to see you kids. I mean, I've done my work. Now you're off on your own. And she says, but mommy, where's my, you know, water? No, uh, they can't even say mommy yet. No, God didn't just leave them alone. They grew. And are they little stinkers? Probably. There's going to be sinners. She's got to teach them how not to sin. But it doesn't mean they're not alive. And that's the way it is with my Lord and Savior. I'm a child of God. And that means I'm alive in Him. Amen? And He hasn't left me alone. And one of the ways that you can know that you're saved is that if you can sin and get away with it, you're probably not saved. <laughs> but if you know that the Lord Jesus is living in your heart, you can't live in sin and be happy. Now, of course, we, well, we get into all that. But you understand what I'm saying? A Christian, I know by personal experience, a Christian, the most miserable person in the world is a Christian who tries to willfully live outside the will, will of God. Uh, because he loves you and he died for you. 
and he wants you to have the very best for you. Take come up, come upon, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. But come unto me, my way, my truth, my life. That's the message that we preach. That's the message that the world needs to hear. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for what it can do in our lives. And we know that it's faith that comes by hearing and hearing by your word. We thank you, Lord, that without this faith, it is impossible to please you. So, Lord, we want to believe you and what you say and what you do in our lives. And we want to rejoice in you, Lord, in all things, giving thanks to you, for we know that whatever happens in our lives is your will for us. So, Lord, we pray your blessings upon us as you have promised us eternal life. But you have also empowered us and you have told us that your mission for us is to tell others about what you've done for us. Bless your people, Lord. Use us for your glory. May the message from this church be that we are witnesses for Christ. For in Jesus' name we pray, amen.